This is the Ancazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Ancazine Brief, we talk with Dr. Sturgio Pulis, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Ibsen, a global biopharmaceutical group headquartered in Paris, France, at this year's annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, in Chicago, Illinois. The American Society of Clinical Oncology is the largest organization of its kind, and this year nearly 40,000 attendees gathered in Chicago to discuss the latest findings and advancements in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. I'm Peter Hofland, here with Sonia Portillo, and this is the Young in Brief. The theme of this year's annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology is delivering discoveries, expanding the reach of precision medicine. In the past few decades, precision, precision medicine has allowed for many advantages for improving treatments for patients with advanced, difficult-to-treat diseases that don't respond to traditional chemotherapy. In this interview, we're speaking with Dr. Sturgio Polis, the Chief Medical Officer at Ibsen, about some of the exciting presentations at this year's ASCO. We also discuss an investigational drug regimen that is being studied for use as first-line treatment in advanced or metastatic pancreatic cancer. Advanced or metastatic pancreatic cancer is very difficult to treat, and it does not have many treatment options. It's also a disease that, like colorectal or ovarian cancer, is often discovered in late stages when treatment becomes exceedingly difficult and chances of survival decrease. We speak with Dr. Sergio Polis on the data presented regarding this challenging disease area, as well as other topics that were discussed at this year's meeting. Let's listen. Here at uh, the ASCO meeting, uh, which is covered by uh, the Oncocene Brief, uh, we are meeting uh, Dr. Sergio Poulos. Um, he is um, from Ibsen. He works for Ibsen. And um, we're going to ask him a couple of questions about a clinical trial, uh, but also some other questions about uh, medicine in general, um, dealing with some of the exciting things uh, that we have uh, seen here over the last couple of days during the uh, annual meeting of uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Sergio Poulos, um, you've been here um, at ASCO probably for a couple of days. Yes. Um, what are some of the exciting things, other than your own studies and trials, um, that you may have noticed um, in, in the treatment of maybe pancreatic cancer, that's what you're focusing on, uh, but maybe some other um, trials and studies as well? Uh, great question, and uh, thank you very much for uh, taking time to talk to us. Um, I, I must say that uh, the excitement that comes around being ASCO is really, uh, you know, uh, over the years, seeing more and more people involved, seeing more and more people in the war and the fight against cancer, seeing the, the commitment that people have to be able to fight this deadly disease. I mean, that's really the excitement that I find, because... Every time I come to Chicago over the past 10 years, I just I find it more difficult to walk from one corridor to another. While most people get annoyed, that actually gives me hope, right? Because that, that shows that there are more people involved. So I can't really own, uh, pretty much um, share that sort of enthusiasm, though, for what we see in pancreatic cancer, right? Pancreatic cancer itself being an uh, extremely lethal disease, mm-hmm. Uh, while its incidence is low, uh, and probably one of the lower ones, uh, what we do find it's um, it's within the top three killers in both men and, and women, uh, behind uh, obviously lung cancer and breast cancer, and and, um, and what we do find is that we've had a paucity of real treatments over the past thirty years, twenty years, well thirty years, right? Mm-hmm. 86 was when uh, gemcitabine came out. So you can imagine, 32 years. Right. And oddly enough, also, in the past 35 trials, we've only had one or two approvals. So it, it shows you, um, with, without really bringing it as a pun, the graveyard of drug development when it comes to pancreatic cancer. Right. We have only a few choices, albeit much more than we had before. If you look at, um, let's say, even um, 10 years ago, first-line treatment versus you know, going into that second line, that almost didn't exist. 
right? Or if it did, it was pretty much on a whim. It wasn't based on factual data that gave us information on what we should be giving. And really, with the approval of Onivide in second line, it's the first and only recommended from NCCN guidelines for treatment post a gem-based therapy in metastatic pancreatic cancer. It's the only one. What does that tell you? It tells you a couple of things. It's a tough disease. It's a very bad disease. And what is it about this disease that makes it difficult to treat? It's, such, it's so fibrotic in nature. It distorts the architecture of the, of the, the actual organ, allowing for difficulties to have drugs to be able to go through and penetrate. Right. Not only does it difficult to penetrate in the architecture, but it encodes the tumor cells, They're almost protecting the tumor in a way from any sort of treatment going in. So you're looking at two situations here. Number one, anatomically, very difficult to get to. And secondly, more importantly, not being able to know enough about it to actually fight it makes it a very lethal uh, disease and, and one that anyone who gets challenged uh, by it really finds itself in, in a very bad position. Now, you mentioned that it is a very difficult um, disease to find. The, the organ itself is difficult to yeah. find. Um, fight. And, and find in yeah, fight. Yeah, to get to. Right, yes, to get to. Absolutely. Um, if you look at, at the treatments for, for example, colorectal cancer um, or ovarian cancer, uh, very often you see um, patients coming in very late, in late stage versions of, of the disease. Um, how early or how late is, is, is pancreatic cancer often discovered? That's a great question. I think you, without realizing it, you answered it. You put it into the same category of diseases where we find it later than we should. The initial diagnosis um, really comes out of vague symptoms. It's only now recently that we've also found some sort of linkage to inherited disorders. So people actually have a tendency of thinking about it in a certain you know, small percentage of population. So we know that it's linked to uh, BRCA, mm-hmm. um, one and two, two mostly. Um, which but, is also linked to breast cancer, for Which example. is linked to breast cancer, exactly, and other inherited uh, disorders as well. So it, it's, it's put people on alert that they have to think about it. Uh, we do tell people also, if you have a young patient that comes in with pancreatic cancer, and has you know, died, and if we've seen, obviously, other family members, it would be good to, to get checked. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is also a very small cohort of patients, right? A very small cohort of patients. But then the others, we have to rely on vague symptoms. You know, gas, um, abdominal pain, some distension. Could be from anything. Very vague. And then, obviously, for the longest time, we also saw that there was a, a more of a correlation with alcoholism uh, and then to males. And when you associate that, obviously men have a tendency of being less likely to look at some symptoms. Uh, whereas we know with the female population, they're more inclined to go and find out what's wrong. We're now going to take a short break, after which we're back with Dr. Sturgiopoulos, Chief Medical Officer at Ibsen, a biopharmaceutical group headquartered in Paris, France, about new data presented at the 2018 annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncogen Brief. Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov generic drugs. Generics are safe, 
effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. And welcome back. This is the Young Cuisine Brief. And if you're just joining us, we are interviewing Dr. Sturgio Pullis, Chief Medical Officer of Ibsen, about some of the exciting news and abstracts presented at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, also known as ASCO, which took place June 1st to 5th in Chicago, Illinois. Let's go back to the program. Yeah. Now, one of the things on the symptoms you mentioned is bloating. Yes. Absolutely. Um, if you look at different kind of very difficult to treat cancers, like ovarian cancer, for example, often uh, women describe that often as something to do with their men- men- menstrual cycle. Yep. Um, in, in pancreatic cancer, obviously, it's, it's different. Um, so if you have some of the symptoms that may be recognizable as potentially dealing with pancreatic cancer, I mean, what, what do you recommend patients to look at? in terms, or a potential patient, somebody that doesn't feel well, to be concerned about and maybe have to visit a doctor? You know, it's, it's very difficult to get into people's minds that they have to have a lower threshold to really consider some vague symptoms as a possibility of something. I think it's mostly evident to people that are, have had someone in the family or recognize someone who's had the disease before that allows them to think in that manner. But my, my whole feeling is if you've noticed a change in your stools, if you've had this bloating and it hasn't gone away, if you've noticed a, a difficulty in eating, a loss of appetite, something feels stuck in, in, my, in my chest and abdomen when I'm eating something, um, weight loss, you know, obviously these are a little bit later as we go, but oddly enough, if you catch it fast enough, you think about it fast enough, get you there to a much better stage fast enough. And, and I, would, I would just suggest to, to have people don't always blow symptoms off. Your body's mm-hmm. telling you something. Right. Listen. Many times we avoid it, but listen. Right. Now, obviously, there are certain risk factors. Yep. And if you look at risk factors, sometimes smoking is a risk factor. Um, sometimes dietary restrictions or not having dietary restrictions may be uh, a risk factor. Uh, if you look at, at uh, pancreatic cancer, what, what are some of, of the, 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 the things that may be um, a risk factor in this case? So um, it, it's, it's interesting because we've associated certain risk factors with it. Um, obviously, uh, alcoholism, mm-hmm. prior alcoholic cysts, um, uh, and um, uh, obviously, certain diseases that are, they can be associated. Um, some of the uh, diabetic uh, situations, people are known, diabetes, to have some correlation. While looking at the anatomy, it's, it's totally different one from the other, but there is some sort of association. Obviously, the inherited disorders, as we mentioned before. And if, if you've noticed that you've had some sort of um, issues with certain, um, uh, I would say, uh, excretory um, mm-hmm. effects which break down proteins and whatnot in your GI system gives you a little bit of a sense of something going on. Um, other than that, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to be able to say much more. We're learning more about it. Um, one of the problems is that we've seen that it's so aggressive that it's not that people have shied away from it, but it's been very difficult to, to actually treat and go after Whereas, you know, things like breast cancer and lung cancer and, and so many of the other uh, diseases, it's, it's a much more powerful group of people behind it. And because of its higher incidence, it gets much more, I would say, of the uh, mainstream media. Right. Whereas I think the notoriety of pancreatic cancer and the difficult in getting to it has put it a little bit in the back burner. But we've seen huge movements from uh, patient advocate groups, um, PanCan has, has done some great work in really bringing this to the forefront. T- as tell well. us a little bit about them. So uh, Pancreatic Cancer Alliance is a, a wonderful group um, that has gone together and has formed a, um, an organization that not only advocates for the learning of, of pancreatic cancer, but has also formed a group within them that allows them to um, perform studies, work with uh, academic and industry uh, to be able to see what's the best possible way to go through and get newer treatments. But if you can also imagine, they, they're working closely with the FDA, mm-hmm. uh, statistical support to be able to come up with possibilities on 
running better and more specific clinical trials to be able to get to the answers that we need. What about early detection? Uh, often um, it's, it's very important to get a cancer very early, um, but we were talking a little bit about that uh, during the break. Um, how important and how possible is that in this particular cancer? So it, pretty much as we said before, um, what happens uh, for most of uh, people going in there, and this is why we wound up finding it later, is there, there is this vague symptoms that are associated with it. I think it's, it's, it's prudent to say that we'd like to have people think of something almost immediately, mm-hmm. even no matter how vague the symptom may be. The problem that arises is that it's, it's difficult to get people to tr- trigger that sort of thought process unless there's education out there. I think while we can be very thankful for many of the groups um, that are out there advocating for pancreatic cancer and the, and the, the help in treatment of pancreatic cancer, such as Stand Up for Cancer, AACR, PANCAN, and so many others, um, the education's still not there. Mm-hmm. We're not at that level. We need to get there. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a stepwise process, and eventually I think we need to have people realizing it more and more. It's not as obvious as other diseases, right? Breast cancer, you feel a lump. You see a change. There's a retraction. Um, breathing in for your lung cancer. For liver, there's pain. There's ascites. Um, there's, there's multiple things that you can look at. But here, the, it is quite vague. It right. is quite vague and very, very difficult to come to. But education is the way to go. Okay. Now, Let's look a little bit at the current state of affairs when it comes to treatment. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So treatment um, in pancreatic cancer um, is, is, as I mentioned before, I mean, in, when we look at from 1986, gemcitabine really came out. Um, it hasn't been that much of, of an addition to things. There's a lot of has been added to it. Uh, once again, added to gemcitabine. Um, uh, napacotaxel added to gemcitabine. Uh, and these are all in the front stages, right? So it could be from adjuvant um, all the way to to uh, the initial treatments in metastatic. And, and by adjuvant, just for your viewers or your 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 uh, people out there, is it's post-surgical, right, to, to be able to, to put it in terms that could be understood. Um, the concern, though, is we haven't had much more since. And gem, gemcitabine, while being a great regimen, we still have a significant amount of patients that blow through therapies. We know because of this disease, there's two sort of patients that we worry about the most. Number one is the ones that are intolerable to the therapies out there. And that's scary. Right. right? That's very scary to our uh, treating physicians. Number two, and more importantly, are the very aggressive pancreatic cancers that it doesn't matter what you give, they blow through it. And there, it's a significant amount that it has to put you on concern. If you can imagine, though, from 20 years ago to today, the amount of patients that went from a first-line therapy in metastatic to a second line was about 38%. Today, it's about 56 to 60%. So we're almost 18 to 20% more are actually getting a second therapy, a second-line mm-hmm. therapy. Which, as you know, a second line therapy, the only approved therapy right now is uh, the nanoliposomal adrenotecan, Onivac. Um, and other than that, you recycle whatever you could find, um, whether it's a full fox regimen, um, whatever, whatever wasn't given in the first. Right. You try and give. Again but that's also given colorectal cancer, for example. Exactly. Colorectal cancer, um, oddly enough, though, ha- does have more options. Right. right, we do have bevacizumab. We have Fulfox, Fulfiri. We have um, rigorafenib. We have uh, so many other therapies that we can wind up giving. Here, once again, though, limited, very, very limited, on evidence based. What we do find is that f- treating physicians are using their own experiences to dictate how to treat patients. Okay, let's take a short break here, and then we talk a little bit further. If you're just joining us, we are speaking with Dr. Stergiopoulos, Chief Medical Officer of Ibsen, 
a biopharmaceutical group headquartered in Paris, France. And we're talking with him at the 2018 annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncogene Brief. And welcome back. This is the Oncogene Brief. Let's go back to the program. Now, here at ASCO, uh, you and your co-workers, your company, is uh, presenting a new results from a new trial, uh, which includes a combination therapy of a variety of different drugs. Um, tell us a little bit about that, and um, what are some of the results or some of the things that may be uh, very interesting for people to know? Sure. Um, so this isn't your typical trial in the sense that we don't, we're not looking for PFS, OS, and obviously endpoints that of that matter. In the sense that this was a phase one, two, mm-hmm. uh, looking at the addition of... Meaning an early trial. Early trial, right. correct. Looking at how to get a dose, safety issues, and how to move forward so that we get a larger trial uh, utilizing more patients for us to be able to get true evidence. Um, here is a, a position that we're in, l- replacing irinotecan in the Fulfiri regimen, Fulfirinox regimen. And this is in liposomal formulation. Correct. Replacing it and putting in the nanoliposomal irinotecan in its place. The challenges here is that we have to look at, because of the multiple um, drugs within this cocktail, um, how do you combine them appropriately? So we've gone through the, the mean tolerated dose. We've used multiple cohorts, multiple uh, different uh, levels of uh, drug dosing to make sure that, we, number one, we get the right drug dose, not only for efficacy, but also to make sure that it's safe. And our second cohort, our cohort B, is the one that it looks like we're going to move forward with, which the biggest challenge was looking at oxaloplatin and irinotecan within the same regimen because oxaloplatin has a tendency of accentuating the effects of SN38, which is the active metabolite of irinotecan. So the challenge there was to give the good enough dose to be able to do what it needs to do without causing more side effects. So we've moved forward, we're moving forward with the uh, second cohort, which uses 60 milligrams per meter squared for nanosomal, nanosomal uh, nanoliposomal irinotecan, and 60 for oxaloplatin. And then the others remain standard in there. Now, we've uh, sent into clinicaltrials.gov to inform them of this, um, uh, this change and how we're moving to the next stage, which we're going to be looking at a phase three. Um, and then to move that forward. So this was significant for us to get the right dose, to be able to give the right punch to this tumor without causing issues to the patients. Right. Now, <clears throat> look, looking at patients and clinical trials, there are a number of what they call exclusion criteria yes. um, when patients are uh, not considered for a trial. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that in this particular trial and what were you looking for? So the, the inclusion-exclusion criteria for this, once again, not being your typical phase three later trial right. um, where it's, it's looking at specific patient populations in a certain way, this was really um, the major areas that we have to really concern ourselves here is making sure that it's an adenocarcinoma, mm-hmm. pancreatic. Patient has to be over a certain age and above. Um, if in reproductive years that they do not take any treatment for a certain amount of months, Mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So the inclusion and exclusion criteria here was so that we can move forward with getting the right dose regimen. Not as significant for us in the sense that we look at the specific exclusion criteria that we would look in a phase three later trial. But here it's just to optimize what we need to get for dosing. So... And it has to do with the fact that most of the drugs that we are, were included in this particular trial were either registered drugs or were already uh, proven to be yes. relatively safe. Yes, these are drugs that have been used uh, in multiple cancers and specifically in pancreatic cancer and are known to be effective 
in their in their use together, mm -hmm. uh, and that's also something to take into consideration. These are used as a regimen, a cocktail regimen, so not individually. Um, so it's important to make sure that uh, we we did the, the the combination correctly. Can you briefly explain the regimen? Because I know you're referring it with the you're referring to it as NAPOX and APOX, the combination. Can you just tell us maybe about the specific agents and how they work together in this drug cocktail? Sure. So NAPOX is, is um, the acronym that is being used. In essence, it's the fulferinox that we've used in the past, 5-FU, Lucavorin, Irinotica, and Oxaloplatin. But here, in essence, we're removing the Irinotica and replacing it with nanoliposomal Irinotica, hence the NAPOX um, as, uh, as a regimen. It's a, the 5 of Lucavorin is a very common uh, combination. Oxaloplatin and irinotecan are usually added on for multiple reasons, including enhancing activity, because as we'd seen from originally from the trials with uh, colorectal cancer, uh, 5 of Lucavorin was used, but it wasn't as effective until you used an oxaloplatin or irinotecan. And this is why we see in first line and second line for colorectal cancer, they're interchangeable. And in fact, if you use one in the first line, it's known that the second one will be the other one, uh, and vice versa, obviously. Um, so this is the regimen that we have, and we know that together there is a significant amount of efficacy. One works on the other. The concern is usually when having oxaloplatin with irinotecan, the neuropathy that can actually occur from this. And you can have a, a more of an enhanced peripheral neuropathy, meaning your fingers, your extremities, there's a lack of sensation, tingling, and whatnot that can go with it and make it very difficult to have your daily functions. Now, when you uh, were talking about the, the drugs that were uh, being used in this case, you talked about the nanoliposomal formulation. Yes. Um, liposomal formulation is often being used in different kinds of treatments. Um, what is the, how does this relate to a different formulation in nanoliposomal formulation? Tell me a little bit about that. So the benefit of uh, the um, adding the nanoliposomal is it, it, it encodes the actual treatment, mm -hmm. allowing for penetration and l more time of sustaining itself within the body. So it allows for more of a sustained release that can keep going on. Slow, and on. Slower release? Slower release, obviously. Uh, and we're talking about a, a significant uh, half-life uh, of over, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 27, 28 hours um, Nonetheless, um, the benefit here is that when you give a renotecan, it active, uh, the active metabolite of SN38 that it breaks down into, um, the problem is that it can stay within the circulation and doesn't immediately go into the tumor. By having it maintain itself within and keep circulating allows multiple runs to be able to then find its way into the tumor. During the initial phase one study with multiple tumor cohorts, what we did find, in specifically in a breast cohort, uh, we found that we found significant amount of intratumoral SN38 versus circulating SN38, which we find in regular renotecan. Mm -hmm. So the nanoliposomal um, formulation allows this multiple runs so that there's multiple hits and chances of the SN38 going into the tumor. And that's where the significance lies. And that is also the significance in your study in the results that you see. Now, talking about results, um, what, were, what were some of the things that you saw in the benefit to the patient? So, first of all, the initial trial that actually gave us the approval, Napoli 1 trial, what we showed was a significant advantage in survival, and it was an extended overall survival. Uh, in what, terms of? In terms of compared to the, um, what you would have given, let's say, versus, um, so the, the, the trial really looked at nanoliposomal irinotecan with uh, 5 FU and mm -hmm. lucavorin versus without having the irinotecan on there. Right. And what we did find was that there is a significant um, uh, uh, survival benefit. The numbers, uh, 6.1 months versus 4.2. 
We're now going to take a short break. If you're just joining us, we're at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, joined by Dr. Sturgio Polis, Chief Medical Officer of Ipsen, a biopharmaceutical group headquartered in Paris, France. I'm Sonia Portillo, and we'll be right back with Augazine Brief. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting-edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. And welcome back. This is the Oncazine Brief, and if you're just joining us, we're joined by Dr. Sturgio Polis, the Chief Medical Officer at Ipsen, a biopharmaceutical group headquartered in Paris, France, at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Let's get back to the program. That leads to maybe your next question that has to do with the right to try. Mm. Um, so what would you say about that in terms of, okay, well, I'm, I'm a, I might be a patient that has a particular disease, maybe uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, I look at the options. Um, and I may not be the candidate for a clinical trial, uh, but I have the right, quote-unquote, to try. Um, how important is that in, in the development of new drugs or uh, for society in general? Um, I, I must say that giving it some thought, it, it, my answers really just revert to philosophical more than I would like to say political, financial, mm-hmm. or other means. Um, and it, with that said, I, I, I must say, you, you look at the spectrum of patients and the difficulties that they face. And if you have a patient that knows they're, they've only been given a few months versus a patient that knows that they have a chronic disease, how do you think they're going to answer? I don't think they'll have the same answers. I'm, I'm sure about that. I'm sure about that as well. So what, I, what I'd say for that is um, whatever the results will be, we shouldn't in any way lose our rigor in making sure that we create the right treatments for our patients. That should not be replaced by anything regardless. Hmm. But if a patient feels that they are willing, based on educated decision, to do something at a risk, then when I'm faced with that, I'll let you know what I decide. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is certainly still a long path ahead for fighting hard to treat advanced or metastatic cancer. However, the vast amount of data presented at the 2018 annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology shows an exciting future for precision medicine in oncology. And while advancing treatments for these diseases is important, I'm glad Dr. Sergio Polis mentioned the importance of screening regularly and watching out for symptoms that, while may seem insignificant, can be early warning signs of cancer. Indeed, it is important to note that if you are noticing new symptoms or changes in your body, some of which were mentioned by Dr. Sergio Poulos, it could be your body trying to tell you something, even if the symptoms may not seem to be a big deal. Although not all symptoms may be related to a diagnosis of cancer, if you're worried, ask your doctor about it. In many cases, cancers are diagnosed in later stages, simply because a patient might not have paid attention to these seemingly harmless symptoms, or they were simply not being screened frequently enough. This may make treatment harder for the patient and the doctor. To reduce cancer deaths, early diagnosis, advancing new cancer treatments, and encouraging patients to be proactive in protecting themselves against disease are all vital parts of the journey. For more information about pancreatic cancer, such as early detection and screening information, please visit the American Cancer Society's website at cancer.org. This edition of the Oncazine Brief was originally recorded during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which took place June 1st through 5th in Chicago, Illinois. While we only have time to cover some of the exciting news and abstracts in our program, 
Further coverage of the meeting can be found on our website at oncazine.com. For us here at the Oncazine Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via iTunes. In Arizona, you can listen to the Oncazine Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check out our online journal, Oncazine, at oncazine.com. We know that based on this interview, you may have questions, so please submit your questions to our editorial team via email, Facebook, or Twitter. We'll post as many answers as we can on our website, Oncozine. That is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E. Dot com. To help make this program possible, please visit our page at patreon forward slash the Oncusine Brief. That is patreon.com forward slash the Oncusine Brief. Your support for this program is important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new cancer treatments. So again, please visit our page on patreon.com forward slash the Oncusine Brief. If you're living in the United States and wants to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866. And we'll make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, here with Sonia Portillo, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting the oncazine brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only the content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it. The Oncocene Brief is in part made possible by generous support from Kite Rocket. Kite Rocket, making brands more valuable. For more information about public relation beyond classic PR support, contact Martin Pyrrhic at Kite Rocket in Phoenix at 602 443-0030 443-0030 or visit their website at kiterocket.com Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration.